Hey everyone, thanks for being here and thanks for having me. Does this all sound good? Yeah. Cool. So awesome to be here. Uh, I had met uh, Irlinda in uh, San Diego about two years ago and that's how I ultimately ended up here. So uh, tonight, uh, hoping to inspire you to make some positive changes when it comes to the environment and uh, the human race as a whole. Uh, so I'll give you a, a little bit of a background on some of the things that some of the projects that I've been working on and what I've been doing. But I'll give you a little bit of a disclaimer, although this room's probably pretty full of radical people, so it's less needed. But I do a lot of very extreme things, and the idea is to uh, catch people's attention, get them to stop and self-reflect and think about things that they maybe have never thought about. So the things that I do often are very extreme, but my message is actually one of moderation, of treating people with respect, treating the earth with respect, I just go about it in uh, attention-grabbing ways of doing it. So uh, one of my projects is the food waste fiasco. So uh, we waste about a third of all the food we produce uh, in the around the world, about half of all the food we produce in the United States where I live. And so uh, one of my campaigns, I've dived into about 2,000 dumpsters across the United States and about 29 states and a handful in other countries like the UK, but mostly, mostly uh, the United States. And the idea is to create a visual of that helps people understand how much food is being wasted. So this is uh, about two days of dumpster diving in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, you might have seen one of my videos. It was called People Are Good. So I landed in Panama with just the clothes on my back and my passport, which was seven countries away from San Diego. So I landed there with uh, the sandals on my feet, uh, some shorts, a, a shirt, a jacket, a hat, and my passport. And that's literally everything I had. And I had to make it back to San Diego, and the idea was to put myself out there and show the world that, and by doing that, show that there's actually a, an incredible number of good people out there. And if you put yourself out there, people will help. Mainstream media often portrays the world as this very dangerous, uh, you know, crime-ridden place. But the reality is that generally people are actually pretty good. Uh, so that was that, and that that turned into a TV show that was on Discovery Channel. I think it played uh, here, uh, w but with that one, I flew to. Brazil and had to travel to Panama. Um, one of my most recent projects was Trash Me. So for this one was uh, inspired by Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me, where he ate uh, just McDonald's for 30 days. So I try to look at some of the successful th uh, campaigns out there and how I can apply that to environmental activism. So I thought, OK, how can I do something that will really get people thinking about how much trash that they're creating. So here, you don't create nearly as much trash as we do in the United States. It's still a fair amount, but nowhere near as much. So in the United States, the average person creates about four and a half pounds of trash per day, about two kilos. And we throw it in the garbage can, and we never think about it again. Most people never just never think about it again. So I wanted to create a visual that shows people how much it really adds up to. So this is. Uh, me, for 30 days, just living like the average American. I ate, shopped, and consumed just like the average American does. And I had a specially designed suit to hold every piece of trash that I created for the entire month. Um, so this right here is actually about one-third less trash than the average American creates in a month. So that's the idea of that. Um, and then for the last 13 months, I've been traveling uh, the United States and parts of the world. This is every single possession that I own, so everything that I own is, is here with me tonight uh, in the car. Hopefully it's still there, because <laughs> that's everything, even my birth certificate, passport, all of that stuff. So every possession I own, and the, again, so the things that I do are often pretty extreme, but the idea of this is that you know the average person in the United States and a lot of Europe has tens of thousands of possessions, most that we never use. And so by owning just 111 possessions, it gets people to stop and think about how much they have. And really, it's about getting people to think about, am I happy? Am I healthy? And are there things that I could do to change my life to be happier and healthier, more purposeful, more passionate, and live in a way that's better for the earth? So, so, so those are a couple of my campaigns. And really, my life is, is my campaign, just leading by example and showing ways of doing things. But I definitely have not always been an environmentalist, an environmentally minded person, a, a conscious person. Uh, if we rewind about 10 years, this is me <laughs> here on the left. Um, I was a pretty drunk dude, like about as, I know Belgians get pretty drunk, but I, I rivaled everyone in the room. <laughs> so this was a typical night. 
drinking cheap, cheap beer out of plastic cups. And uh, during college, I was or university, I was very passionate about drinking, uh, women, material possessions, money. My goal was to be a millionaire by the time I was 30 years old. So very focused on that. My car, I would shine it for like two hours every Sunday, spotless. Uh, and I had a part-time job, which was basically just going to the library and talking to every girl in, in my path, telling her to come to my parties. So that's what I was doing during college. Um, this is another typical night. This is what you call a duck bong. I don't know if it's made its way to Belgium, how it works. It's, it's like a beer bong, except you cut the beak and the foot off of an ornamental lawn duck, which is hollow, and then you fill it up with beer, and that thing can fit like maybe five, six beers in it. You fill it up with vodka as well, uh, if you feel like it. So that was another typical night. And as I said, I spent you know, 20, 30 hours a week pursuing women. And I wasn't always successful on this <laughs> particular night. This is a Christmas tree that crossed my paths when there was no woman that uh, wanted to come home with me that night. So I have not always been uh, very caring about the environment. I did go to school for biology uh, with a chemistry uh, minor. And then uh, aquatic science was my concentration. So I actually always cared about the environment and was, you know, when I was growing up, fishing and out playing in the ponds and things like that. Um, but the thing was, I always felt like I was actually living an environmentally friendly life during this time. Uh, I, because th my mom had taught me the basic things like recycling, you know, shut off the water when you're not using it. I would occasionally get in a fight with my roommates about leaving the water running or the lights on. And so I was doing some of those things. But what happened was I realized, uh, I realized in about 2011, after I had graduated university, and it was about two years later, I started to watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books, and I realized that m for the most part, my life was actually causing environmental and social destruction. The little th I was doing a couple of things that were sort of good, good for the environment, but the reality was I, I realized by watching these documentaries, the food I was eating that was coming from factory farms, the gasoline that I was pumping into my car, all of the trash that I was creating, all the cheap products that I was buying, at the big box markets. All of this stuff was causing environmental destruction both in my community, but also because of globalization all the way on the other side of the world. But also it was causing social destruction by people working in really crappy conditions so I could have my $4 toaster and things like that. So at that point, I really decided that I wanted to change my life from you know drunk dude to someone that was living for something beyond myself. And so a lot of people at this point feel a total sense of doom and gloom. Like, what can I do now? I mean, at that time, I was 25 years old. I'd been doing this whole way of life for quite a while. And so it can be, you can have that feeling of, well, wh what can I possibly do? But I actually, at that point, felt uh, extremely empowered. And, th and the reason was, these documentaries that I watched and these books that I was reading, they taught me how I could change my life. So what I did is I just made a long list of, of all the changes that I wanted to make, and I hung it up in my kitchen in a really prominent place, and then I taped a pen next to it so that each week that pen would be there, and my goal was to check off one thing each week. So some examples of things that I did early on. I mean, at that time, I was shopping at Walmart, filling up my cart with everything, uh, and using plastic bags and all that sort of stuff. So I was doing very little. So one of the big changes early on that I made was just starting to go to local businesses. This is a farmer's market, just buying my food locally from the local farmer's market or going to the local tool shop rather than the, the big um, Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart or things like that. Uh, I changed my, you know, realized the food I was eating, changed my diet, started to eat more whole foods, more unpackaged processed stuff, actually started to look at the ingredients on things and see like, whoa, this isn't even really food that I'm eating. So started to started to eat actual food, uh, switched to a more plant-based diet. And then the other thing is that, that when I started to really unravel my life, I started to realize that I had just been sold a whole lot of things, sold this concept of what the human body needs to exist, what we need to be uh, successful or happy or healthy. And so the story of stuff was an early uh, short film that, that really inspired me. And they had another one called The Story of Cosmetics. And I learned that all these things I was using, like all, all of the, the, the shampoo, the conditioner, the face wash, the body wash, the deodorant, 
the Listerine mouthwash, the lip balm, like all of these things, a lot of them were made with fossil fuel byproducts, petroleum byproducts, and I was just putting all this nasty stuff on me, and I just really started to think, wow, you know, human beings have existed for millions of years without this stuff, so I, it must be possible to live without it. So I put it all on my curb, um, and for the most part, stopped using most of those things, but found natural alternatives for the things that I did want to continue to use. Got rid of plastics and things like that. Got rid of my microwaves so that I'd actually cook real food. So I was just, I just continued making positive changes in my life uh, for about two years. And what happened was, uh, the more positive changes I made, the more happy and healthy I became. And uh, a lot of it wasn't something that I would necessarily realize, but there were all sorts of connections. Like, for example, when I got rid of my car and I no longer had a trunk, I was no longer able to fill it up with stuff, which meant that I, I bought less stuff. So there were all these ways that I didn't realize how one change would ripple into other changes as well. So after a year and a half or so of doing all of that, I decided that I really wanted to uh, take sustainable living and bring the message out to people and do it in a way that was uh, kind of fun, would, would, would uh, get people excited and hopefully inspire people to make positive changes as well. So in 2013, uh, I made my website for $100 online and uh, made a Facebook page and decided I was going to be an adventurer making, uh, you know, doing adventures for the environment. So my first big adventure was called Off the Grid Across America and I biked across the United States on a bamboo bicycle and the idea was to bike from west coast to east coast having no environmental impact whatsoever, no negative environmental impact while deeply immersing in sustainable living and learning myself. Because they, they say that it takes 21 days to form a habit, so I thought if I do this for 104 days, which is how long the ride was, then I'll really deeply form this habit. So I set rules for all of the, the basics of sustainable living. So the key things of sustainable living that we deal with every single day, food, water, energy, waste, transportation. These are the things that every single one of us in this room deals with basically every day. We eat every day. We drink water every day. We tr Usually we have transportation if it's wherever we're going. Um, we create waste every day, whether it's garbage or it's something out of our body. And then energy, we're using electricity pretty much every day. So diving into these key things that a lot of us, like th that for me in the past, I never thought about in a given day. So for food, the rule was I could only eat local organic, unpackaged food. So that meant food from whatever state that I was crossing through. Organic just meant, you know, that I, it didn't mean necessarily that it was certified, but it just came from the farmer and I talked to them. And then lastly, unpackaged. So nothing wrapped in packaging. But I knew that this was going to be really hard because a lot of places that food just doesn't exist. So I had made one exception and that was that I could eat any food that was going to waste. And the reason being is, of course, if if it's already in the, the garbage, the dumpster, what do you call it over here? Bin, yeah, bin. Huh? Volbach. <laughs> I find your language quite funny. <laughs> um, so if it's in the garbage, the environmental impact has already happened. So there's, you know, if it's in the garbage, I figured, that sounds weird. If it's in the garbage, I might as well eat it. But that's what I was doing. So, um, so I found the first dumpster that I ever looked to into, I was crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains. It was about seven days in. And I, I looked in there. I was, I was really nervous at this time because I still had a pretty good sized ego at that time. And for someone to know that I was eating out of the trash would have damaged that ego. But I had come up with this trip and I had to do it. So I looked inside the dumpster and sure enough, it was, it was filled with perfectly good food. In that particular dumpster, the, the first thing I ever ate was a still frozen half gallon of Moose Tracks ice cream that was just melted a little bit around the edge. I ate like three quarters of it. I didn't have a spoon, so I just used my sunglasses and they were quite sticky for a week or two. Um, and so uh, basically for the rest of the trip, instead of going into the grocery store and asking, do you have anything local? Because the answer was, what do you mean? You know, most of the time they just, they just had no clue where any of the food was from. So I got tired of that. So instead, 70% of my diet that summer ended up coming from the dumpster. It was about three pounds a day worth of food, 280 pounds. So for water, the rule was I could only use natural bodies of water. So for the entire summer, I couldn't have turned on a faucet, used a flush toilet, taken a shower, 
uh, any way that we use water in a given day in the house, I, I wasn't able to do. So uh, instead, I had to use natural bodies of water like lakes and rivers, purify the water myself, go swimming, even in some pretty dirty ponds. Um, but the exception, again, with that was that I could use water that was going to waste. So this is a fire hydrant in Brooklyn. The leak is right here. And uh, so I lived off this fire hydrant for five days while I was in Brooklyn. I bathed in it. That's what I'm doing here. Uh, I uh, took, I brushed my, went over there to brush my teeth, did my laundry in it, uh, used it for cooking, all of that. And so this one leak alone is waste, uh, I timed it, and it was wasting two gallons of water per minute. So that's about eight liters per minute. So it's, what that means is it's 770 gallons of water per day, which is enough to meet the drinking needs of 1,440 people, just out of this one fire hydrant alone. So uh, over the entire trip, I only used 160 gallons of water, which is what the average person in the United States uses in, in about two days. For energy, I could only use electricity that I created myself for the entire uh, summer, so I wouldn't have been able to give, in, to give this presentation. I wouldn't have been able to touch this or, or use any of this stuff. Couldn't turn on a light switch or use someone's refrigerator or uh, you know open an electric garage door. Basically, every way that electricity was involved in life, I had to stop and think about it. And so, um, you know, there was the challenging ones, like, for example, if I wanted to go into a store uh, and there was only automatic doors, I'd have to wait there until someone goes through the automatic door and then <laughs> go in. Or if I was biking and it was night and an automatic light would go off, I'd have to go over there and unscrew that light bulb and hope that they would figure it out, like, the next day why it's not going off. But... So it was, uh, it was a really deep immersion, and what I learned is that my life is totally electrified. At all, at all points of my life, basically, I was consuming electricity. 70% um, or more of electricity in the United States is from fossil fuels, so I was basically burning fossil fuels at most times. But only by really deeply immersing into this was I really able to start understanding it more. So... For example, you know, my exception with electricity was I had my um, I had a computer and I had a, a cell phone and they were both charged by the solar panels, but uh, my exception was I could log on to the internet and I knew that by doing that I was probably using some electricity via you know the router using more probably using a little more electricity, but what I didn't learn didn't know and that I learned on that trip uh, I visited a business uh, called Renewable Choice Energy in in Boulder. Colorado, and their job is to get companies like Facebook and Google to switch over their servers. So the servers are the places that host the computers where all of the data is stored. So their job is to get them to switch over to solar and wind-powered uh, farms to to produce the electricity for that. And so what they what they taught me was that when we're storing stuff on the cloud, what the cloud really is is just someone else's computer, some somewhere else. And so what I learned is that every single time that I uploaded a, blo uploaded a blog or a YouTube video or a picture to Facebook, that all of that was being stored somewhere else. So every second of my life, whether I was asleep or I was awake, was actually burning electricity. And so only by really deeply going into it was I able to start to understand more deeply my interaction with the earth. So for waste, uh, the rule was I could uh, I had to carry every piece of garbage that I created all the way across the country with me. So if I had a candy bar in San Francisco, that wrapper was coming all the way to Vermont with me. And anyone who bikes, which I'm guessing a lot of you do, or if you've done long distance hiking, you know like a little weight, you know, really adds up. So uh, I, I tried really hard to create as little trash as I could, and this is what I created in 104 days. So this is two pounds which is what the average American creates by about 1 o'clock in the afternoon on any given day. And then lastly, for transportation, uh, the rule, of course, was that I could only bike or walk, be walk the entire way. So even on my off days, I couldn't use public transportation. Um, and so what I learned during this time, which is a lesson that I'm sure a lot of people here in Belgium know, you're far ahead of us when it comes to cycling, but uh, really, I learned that cycling is for everyone. On that trip, I met 60- and 70-year-old women cycling all the way across the United States. I met 10-year-olds uh, cycling to school. I met people that were way larger than you ever would have imagined would fit on a bike, that were biking hundreds of miles or biking 30 miles back and forth between work. And so I really learned on that, on that trip that 
cycling is something that's ex that's accessible to so many people. So after that uh, after that adventure, I I moved back. I went back to San Diego, and I was in my apartment uh, that I had still, and um, I still was still still at this time after a couple of years, still constantly picking up on ways that I was causing environmental destruction. So, for example, when I got back to San Diego, one of the things that I learned is that, you know, I had my money in uh, Chase Bank account, J.P. Morgan Chase, and I, I realized, wow, what's going on with my money? Well, they invest in, uh, largely in fossil fuel infrastructure projects. So, here I am trying not to use fossil fuels, but my money is being used to invest to make fossil fuels more accessible. So I had to take my money out of the big banks. I had to take my money out of any investments. Like I learned that my mutual funds were invested in uh, cigarettes and fossil fuels, among other things. So taking my money out of those. And then by this time, I was creating so little trash that I was able to take the garbage can out of my house. So then in 2015, in January, uh, it was New Year's Day. I decided that I wanted to move out of my apartment and live in a a tiny house so that I could live off the grid and not have any bills or any debt to my name. So I went on to Craigslist uh, New Year's Day and I was going to buy myself a little camper so that I could live in that while building a tiny house. And I found this online and it said, it said it was $950 and I thought surely that must be a typo. I mean $950, that's like one month's rent for a lot of people. So I put $950 in my pocket. Uh, well, actually, $1,000 in my pocket, and I biked up to this guy's house. It was about six miles away, and I said I, I, said I wasn't going to buy it, but I don't know why I had the $1,000 in my pocket if I wasn't going to. Um, but I realized why it was only $950, because it was basically just a little wooden box on wheels. It was five feet wide, so this is actually larger. This screen right here is larger than the actual size of the house, because five feet wide is substantially shorter than this. And also, uh, it was about five feet tall, so I couldn't quite stand in it, but I thought, okay, I, this is much smaller than I was intending to live in, but I like to do extreme things, and you know, one of the things that really stuck out to me is that in the United States and in many parts of Europe, the average house size has actually doubled in the last couple of decades. So in the States, it's gone from 1,500 square feet to 3,000 square feet. So this is where house size has been going. And at the same time, happiness and health is just crashing. So it's just trying to show that correlation between, between having a larger house and actually being healthier and happier. A lot of times, I see an opposite correlation with that. So here, I practiced uh, sustainable living also to the extreme to really, uh, again, do things that would really catch people's attention, get the news to come out and report, and be able to bring this stuff to people that maybe have never thought about any of these things before. So uh, for food, I grew some of my own food. You, you here in Belgium have plenty of rain, I'm assuming, but San Diego was uh, a desert and it was in a mega drought. So it wasn't exactly easy living off the grid and being completely dependent on rainwater and growing food. But one way I was able to do that is there's something called uh, wicking bed gardens. And how these work is you, you, fill, you create a little reservoir on the bottom uh, and then you fill it through a pipe, and then, the, and then the water wicks up through the roots so that there's no evaporation at the top. So by using tricks like that, I was able to grow more food with less water. So uh, while I was there, 100% uh, of my water came from harvesting, har harvesting rainwater. And um, so the average American uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water per day. The average European uses about 50 gallons of water per day. And the average African uses about two to five gallons of water per day. So I was using two to five gallons of water, about, about the same as the average person in Africa. And so a lot of people would think that this is, you know, most, uh, most Americans would think that this is really extreme, using so little water. And one of the things that I've really learned over the last five years of really diving into sustainability is that everything is totally a matter of perspective. So in this, in this scenario, for example, an American would see that using just two to five gallons of water to, per day to be a really extreme thing. But if you took someone from Africa that's been doing that their whole life and they brought, you brought them to the United States and they saw that, that we're using 100 gallons of water just pouring it down the drain, to them that would be extreme. So the more that I looked at all of these things, really everything is always a matter of perspective. And when you change your perspective, you can totally change the world around you just simply by changing your mindset. So uh, 
I was able to live on two to five gallons of water per day by using it really wisely uh, and really just not wasting any of it. And then so for energy, the rule was, uh, or the for energy, I was just living completely off of uh, solar there. So the reason I was able to do that was by living pretty simply. So another thing that, that I've uh, really come across a lot is that a lot of people think that sustainable living uh, or environmentally living is really something you can only do if you're uh, wealthy or privileged to be able to do that. And so there's elements of that where I understand where people are coming from and some truth to that. But what I've learned is that the more that you simplify your life and live based on what you need rather than everything that you think you want, the more accessible it becomes to everyone. So for example, with solar, uh, if I needed, if I had a, a huge refrigerator and a flat screen TV in every room and a hair dryer and all these electrical items, then I wouldn't have been able to afford to live uh, off the grid with just solar because I would have needed a ten or $15,000 system. But by simplifying my needs, I was actually able to to live just off of solar. Uh, so this is funny. We're talking about uh, uh, poop for the second time tonight after the first documentary. That's great. Did you uh, plan that? No. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this is my favorite. This is actually my favorite thing to talk about, uh, and and I feel actually very sa very much the same with the, the 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 short film that we just watched. So one of the things that that I've really learned is that. Anytime something is easy, I've learned to stop and think, why is this easy? Where is the ease? Where is basically what I've learned is that every time something is easy, what that typically means is that the burden is being placed elsewhere. So for a, a, an easy example, for example, everyone here has probably driven a car. And you know that when you are driving a car, you imagine this is your ankle. You're going zero miles per hour and then you just move your ankle slightly forward and all of a sudden you're going 60 miles per hour. Very easy. Whereas biking or walking, it's a, you actually have to use energy to do that. So where is the burden being placed? In that scenario, it's being placed on many things. Uh, the extraction of fossil fuels causing oil spills. There's 10,000 oil spills per year as an example. It's uh, climate change. It's the emissions of all of the greenhouse gases. It's the people that are getting sick working in those conditions the animals that are dealing with those sorts of things. So, And that's that's an example of how the burden is actually being pl placed elsewhere. So I started to think, you know, flushing the toilet. Okay, where does it where does it really go? What, you know, once I'm done with it, what actually happens to my poop and pee? And so uh, the, the toilet is an example of one of those things that's really easy. You just hit that lever and then whew, it's gone. So I started to, to think about, you know, what really happens to it and look into it. And what I learned is that it's easy because the burden is being placed elsewhere. So in the example of the flush toilet, you have all the chemicals that are used to clean the water before you poop in it, and then all the chemicals that are used to clean the water again after you poop in it. You have, uh, you have all of the electricity that's used. So 20% of all electricity is used just to pump water. So you have actually are using electricity indirectly to, to flush the toilet. You have uh, the pollution that happens from it, because a lot of times it overflows into our lakes and rivers and oceans. So all of these things were happening. And then ultimately you have a waste product, something that people have to deal with that's actually a problem. So when I learned about what we call humanure, as in human manure, I realized that instead of waste becoming a problem, it actually is a resource. So one of the sayings in permaculture is that waste is just a resource out of place. So rather than using 1.6 gallons of water each time, which I obviously didn't have to flush, I was able to turn it into a uh, valuable resource. So this is the compost pile. And so a lot of people would, who here has ever uh, pooped in a five gallon bucket? <laughs> Couple? Some back there? Yeah. So for me, this was kind of the holy grail of sustainable living because it was taking responsibility for all of my actions. And so a lot of people, uh, you know, have social media. And so on there, a lot of people have said things like, oh, worry. Like, first of all, they would assume I was going to die. And if I wasn't going to die, that I was going to kill the entire city of San Diego. And so one of the, one of the things about composting, how it works, uh, is when you, a compost pile, whether it's human waste or, or not, uh, what you have is you have microorganisms like bacteria, and then you have macroorganisms like beetles and larvae and worms, what they do is they're eating these, uh, all of the, all of the 
contents in there, and one of the byproducts that from all that is heat. So a compost pile can heat up to about 160 degrees. So all of the bacteria uh, and the pathogens that are in our body are designed to live at about body temperature. So once they're in the compost pile, the heat that's created by all of that movement uh, of, the, of the micro and macro organisms actually kills all of that off, so it's really safe. So I was at least able to tell people that, that I am not indeed going to kill the city of San Diego. But the thing that I didn't know about the time is that people still would say, you know, ew, this guy's eating food grown off of poop. And I was like, yeah, but I don't have a good response because I'm assuming you're not doing that. Um, but then I read uh, a book called Wasteland when I was doing Trash Me this fall, and I finally really learned where our poop goes as I looked into it deeper. So take New York City, for example, where I was at the time. What you have is you have million, well you have eight million people or so there, so uh, about eight million poops a day, maybe more, depending on how people are doing. Um, what's that? Huh? Anyway. Um, so, so what happens is all of that, all of that goes into uh, the wastewater treatment plants. But what you have going along with that, the average person in the United States has like 13 prescription meds total. I mean, some people have zero, some people have 20, but it averages out to billions of prescription medications. So you have all of that going with it. But you also have all the things like the bleach and the Drano and things like that. So all that's getting mixed together. So what you have is an extremely toxic poop slurry that ends up with you know millions of poops mixed with all of this toxins. But then you also have uh, companies that are improperly disposing of things like motor oil and things like that that makes it even more toxic. That then is biodigested in part, and then what's left was turned into fertilizer. And where that fertilizer went is it was shipped down to Texas on rail, so this very still toxic fertilizer, and then that was used to grow the food that people that were commenting on YouTube and Facebook saying, you this guy eats food growing from poop. Well, what I learned was at least I was eating off of fairly clean one person's, not one million New Yorkers' toxic sludge poop. Uh, so for uh, on, on to the next thing. We're done with poop now. It might come up again, though. Um, so for trash, uh, I created a little more trash than I did on my bike ride. This, was, this would be about a normal two to four weeks worth of trash, so it was a, it was a couple pounds a month usually. And uh, for transportation, um, I, one of the things that I learned is that the average person in the States, and it's similar over here in Europe, uh, spends about seven to $9,000 per year on their vehicle. So what that means is that uh, the, 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 the normal, the kind of the median income is, is at about $52,000 a year. So that means that the average person is working, just, is working January and February of every single year just to own their car. So imagine what you could do for January and February of every single year instead of owning a car. And that's the reason that I got rid of my car because growing up, I thought that a car was freedom. You know, it was how to get away from the parents, be able to go wherever you wanted, whenever you wanted. But what I learned is that the car was actually the thing that was holding me back the most. It's what tied me to having to work to pay the, to pay the bills of the car. So getting rid of the car was actually one of the, the most freeing things that I ever did. In San Diego, there's something called uh, car to go which is an electric car share program. That made it easier for me there because when I did need a car, I could get one. But a lot of cities have things like Zipcar and things like that. How, how uh, car to go works is there's a little, you have uh, your own little uh, card here and then you touch it up to the window here and then you just get in it lets you in, you put in a code, and then you drive it away, and then when you're done, you just park it in a parking spot, and it just bills you by the amount of time that you're in there. But for the most part, I would ride my bike. Uh, the car to go is for mostly when I was feeling lazy. Um, so the whole, th you know, the whole idea of a lot of this stuff is to create visuals that help people to understand things. So talking about food waste, um, during, w you know, as I was starting to dumpster dive and I mentioned that you know early on I was pretty timid about talking about that, not knowing what people would think about me and things like that. And um, but the thing was, the more that I the more that I did it, the more I realized that this issue is is far more important than me. Like, so w so I started to talk about it, and I was amazed that after a short period of time, I realized that generally, when you're passionate about something and when you're authentic about something, 
what I found is that you don't lose friends, you actually gain more friends. And so uh, the food waste was uh, what ended up being uh, something that I became really passionate about. And I didn't realize going into it how important of an issue it is, but I've learned that it's actually one of the most uh, pressing environmental and social issues of our time. So worldwide, uh, we throw away one third of all of the food we produce, while over a billion people are in food poverty. So we actually have enough food on earth to feed every single person. Not all of it's healthy food, you know, there's a lot of Cheetos and things like that, but we have enough food to feed the entire world. In the United States, we produce enough food to feed another entire American population while one in four Americans are food insecure. So this is San Diego, California. I, uh, I was trying to come up with a way to, to really help people understand how much food is going to waste. So in the United States, it's $165 billion worth of food per year. So to put that into perspective, that's more than the budgets for every national park, every public library, all of veterans' health care, all the federal prisons, the FBI, and the FDA combined. So it's a, it's a massive number, but a lot of times it's still hard to wrap your head around numbers. So this is two days worth of dumpster diving in San Diego, California. Um, and I mentioned, uh, you know, when I early on I was very timid about the idea of dumpster diving. And one of the reasons was this girl here, four years ago, this was 2013, I was very much in love with her and she was very much like, you know, get away from me, Rob, I'm not interested in you right now. Um, and so she was actually someone who told me, don't tell anybody you're dumpster diving. So I kind of listened to her because I, I was just kind of taking her advice. And so uh, this is us four years later. She uh, obviously came around. And uh, what I learned is that you can eat your trash and have a be girlfriend too. <laughs> so uh, this project, it was called Trash Me. Uh, this is the one that I just finished up in, uh, in September. And as I said, you know, with so many of these things, we, we just never think about it because the infrastructure is there that takes things away and then we never have to think about it again. So the average American creates four and a half pounds of trash per day, throws it in the garbage can, and then where does it really go? So the idea of this visual was to just really help people to, uh, to think about these things on a daily basis. So you have the, uh, the, the uh, frozen pizza here, you have like the Starbucks cups and the red uh, beer cups and the packaging from buying stuff, the, the batteries, the plastic bottles, and the idea was just, you know, to, to create that association in people's mind and help people to, to actually think about that. So um, the whole idea of all of this is to, to really just, uh, you know, get people to self-reflect and, and think about what positive changes that they can make in their life. And so these are some of the things that, uh, that I think that, that I've been making over the last five years that I've found to be really beneficial. And um, so just some of this, some of the suggestions for anyone who is inspired to make positive changes. I broke these down into, into the basic aspects of sustainable living, food, water, energy, waste, and transportation. And each, each one of these is on my website. There's a guide for all of these. So this one's food is, for example, robgreenfield.tv slash food, and it goes more in depth there. But so for food, some of the things are eating, you know, as much local food as possible. So eating as much food that's, that's grown in Belgium or n if not Belgium, more like Spain rather than New Zealand or Chile. Um, eating as much organic, natural food as possible, stuff that's not sprayed with pesticides, uh, unpackaged foods. Is there any grocery stores in here that sell unpackaged? What are they called? Una? Una. So, So, uh, so going to stores like that where you can buy food, you bring your own containers and fill them up. Uh, whole foods, so not the grocery store, but just, uh, just foods that grow, uh, foods that look basically like they did when they came from the earth. So for example, apples rather than applesauce or potatoes rather than potato chips. Uh, growing your own food, so it's life changing, just planting a seed and actually seeing that turn into food and then eating it. It it's can be a very life changing experience. Um, eating seasonal, so stuff that grows, you know, that's growing in season. So if it's if it's middle of January and you see strawberries at the store, thinking, where are these strawberries actually from? Another, you know, one of the simplest things we can do with food is actually eat it. So uh, the average person wastes about 25% of all of their food. So simply eating the food rather than throwing it away. 
Uh, and then another big one is uh, eating a lot more fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, grains, and a lot less meat. This actually is the one that causes the most environmental impact, uh, eating uh, meat and animal products. So that one actually sh should be more at the top, which leads into the next one, which is water. So the average, or sorry, to, to create one hamburger takes about 660 gallons or about 3,000 uh, liters of water. So to put that into perspective, on my bike ride across the country, I went 104 days without showering. So imagine, imagine 104 days without showering. Now imagine turning that into an entire year, which is what I did. In one year of not showering, that was the equivalency of six hamburgers worth of water. So two months of showering is equivalent to one hamburger. That's how much water it takes to produce um, meat. Well, b that's particularly beef that's the most, most water intensive. So other things you can do, flush the toilet less. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Uh, take, do you have that saying here? Hmm. Oh, it's new. I brought it to Belgium. Uh, take shorter showers. Every minute off the shower is two minutes. Is about two gallons. Uh, grow food, not lawns. That's one of the really the the most enjoyable things. Is rather than growing grass, uh, actually just growing food instead. So using that using that water to grow food instead of uh, instead of grass. Harvesting rainwater. Some people make these things really complicated. Uh, one thing about all of these things that I'm that I'm naming off. They're all you know, designed to decrease your environmental impact, but the nice thing is that they don't actually cost you money. They're all designed to save you money, which means that you can work less and spend more time doing the things that you want. Uh, and then lastly, besides the fact that most of these make the earth healthier, they also make you healthier, which is a nice thing about it. Um, so harvesting rainwater, some people make that really complicated and they get like a $300 system, and I did that when I first started to rain harvest rainwater, but then I realized you literally just have to stick a bucket under your gutter and collect that water, it's just as simple as that. Um, installing efficient faucets, so you can get little, uh, little faucet heads, they cost about $3, they use 75% less water, so switching those things out you know, takes a couple of minutes and then you're saving a gallon and a half per minute that you have it on. Uh, planting native, so planting things that naturally grow in the area. Installing gray water, another thing that you can do really simple is, for example, put a five gallon bucket under your sink and unscrew the thing so it goes into the bucket and then just take that out to the garden. That's the simplest form of gray water. Switching to CFL or LED bulbs, so LED bulbs, they cost more, but after usually after three months to a year, uh, they've already paid for themselves in the amount of electricity that you're, you're, you're using. Uh, finding an electricity-free alternative, for example, getting a juice press that's uh, like a hand juice press rather than an electric one, uh, or investing in alternative energy. You can put solar panels on your roof, or you can just invest in an uh, energy co-op that, that uses the co-op money from people to create, uh, I don't know, it's basically investing in an alternative energy co-op. Uh, and then lastly, nature. So uh, simply, the more time that you're out in nature, the less time that you're uh, burning energy. Uh, and then for waste, the five R's are uh, re refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, recycle. So one of the things that I never knew is that, well, even the three R's, are uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, are actually in that order for a reason. At first it's reduce, then reuse, and then lastly, recycle. So people like uh, Bea Johnson or Lauren Singer, some of the leaders of the zero waste movement, and people that are practicing zero waste, the idea isn't actually to recycle more, it's actually to recycle less, because recycling is a very energy intensive process, that's why it's at the bottom. Um, car carrying a reusable water bottle, one of the big ones is saying no to disposable items, so anything that you look at and you would say, well I use this just one time and throw it away, instead finding a uh, reusable alternative, for example carrying your own plate or bowl or utensils rather than disposables. Uh, buying unpackaged food, uh, buying used stuff. So there's a, uh, what kind of websites do you have p here for buying used stuff? Uh, they have like Gumtree, Freecycle, Freegal in the UK. Do you have those here as well? Yeah. So buying used stuff, which means no virgin materials are needed for you to have something. Uh, repairing things, so when something's broken or, or slightly unfunctioning, fixing it rather than throwing it away and getting a new one. 
uh, donating stuff that you don't need anymore, giving it to friends or a thrift shop rather than throwing it away, buying quality stuff uh, that won't break, and composting. And then for transportation, which is the last one, so one of the huge ones is going car free, not owning a car, uh, joining a car share program if you still need to drive a car. Uh, driving less is, the, is a simple one. If you are going to own a car still, just simply driving less makes a huge difference. Uh, if you ride a bike, which there's no point in even talking about this here. I mean, I saw like a million bikes, but this is unique for me to see. Actually, when I got here, that when I got into the train station, that was the most bikes I've ever seen in my <laughs> entire life. In the United States, if there's like six bikes in the same space, it's like, whoa, bikers. <laughs> so it's pretty cool to see what's going on here. But uh, so I will take the lesson from you on that one and, and be quiet about the biking. Um, public transportation, which I think is pretty good in Belgium. I mean, even when, you, when you're complaining about public transportation, just imagine being in the United States for a little while because it sucks over there and, and uh, think about it that way. Living near the places that you spend your time, so you spend less time banging your head or you know, being d depressed in the car or in public transportation, being closer to places, and then simply walking. And then um, one of the last ones is, that is supporting environmental organizations supporting environmental nonprofits. So, so as far as philanthropy goes, only 3% of all philanthropic donations go to environmental nonprofits. 97% goes elsewhere. So donating to nonprofits that are working on, the, on environmental issues goes a huge way. Uh, and the other thing is just volunteering with them, just getting involved. A lot of times that's much that can be uh, much more beneficial than, to, than uh, money to them, just getting involved and volunteering. So there's a really awesome nonprofit which was uh, started by Patagonia, the clothing company, about 10 years ago. And so if you own a business, you can uh, join 1% for the planet, and your company gives 1% of all of the revenue to environmental nonprofits. You donate directly to the nonprofits, not to 1%, and they certify it like Rainforest Alliance. But just a month ago, they started that for individuals. So now we can donate 1% to different nonprofits. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't go to them. They just certify you as a 1% for the planet donor. So, uh, yeah, just supporting environmental nonprofits by volunteering or, or uh, donating. And so um, that's everything. And we have plenty of time for questions, right? So, yeah, so who has questions? Forwarding? Oh, voting. Oh, the, so the question is, is there a reason why I don't put voting in the things that you can do? Uh, no, I think that voting is one tool in the arsenal of making positive changes. Um, but it's, not my, it's definitely not my focus by any means. So uh, I think especially on the local level, voting can be extremely effective by as I don't know what the political situation is like here, but I know that voting at the local level is where often it can be the most beneficial for your community. Uh, I didn't, I, yeah, so and pl enough, peop enough people vote and aren't doing these things, so I focus on these things too. Yeah? So actually the biggest thing that any of us can do to make the largest environmental impact is to eat a lot less meat and eat a lot more fruits and vet, you know, a lot more plants. So, you know, one thing is that, uh, you know, as I said many times, I do a lot of very extreme things. But when it comes to all of this, my message is very much moderation. It's not go 100% zero waste. Maybe it's not be 100% vegan. Maybe it's not never get into a car. But it's do things more moderately. So eating a lot more plant-based is the largest thing that we can do envir environmentally, really. I mean, that's kind of, that would be the biggest one. Plus, often, you know, most people eat way too much of it, and they become a lot healthier without it, so you start to feel better, too. Is that, yeah? So, it's everything's been a transitional process. So back in 2011, I started a marketing company, and so I was at that time still fairly money-oriented. And so my first campaign, the bike ride across the country, 
uh, I had money from running a marketing company. So my earlier projects cost more money because the more you have, the more you spend. But during that, this whole time, I've been transitioning away from having a lot of money. So currently, um, my yearly annual salary cap is $5,000 a year to keep myself as minimally involved with money. So now my adventures are funded by being really simple adventures. You can bike across the country uh, living simply without, without spending a penny doing that. For example, dumpster diving for a lot of my food. Wherever I stay, I always just stay with friends or family. I carry a tent so I can camp outside, never, ever, you know, never staying in hotels. Um, and so by focusing on the very basic needs in life, like this year I'm doing a project where I'm not buying anything new or being given anything new for an entire year. So the less you need, the easier. And so now with my, with my campaigns, they are mostly about how you can live more simply. So as I've learned, you know, early on I had that money from the marketing company, but over time they've become less and less necessary to have money. And also largely by uh, living a life that's, um, that's about relationships. Because the more that, the thing is, everyone in this room, if we work together, we can meet most every single one of each other's needs. So by sharing stuff, sharing resources, sharing time, sharing skills, there's so much more that we can accomplish. For example, with my videos, a lot of times I work with videographers who want to make a positive difference through their film. So, and, and I'm able to do something where they're going to get you know, good viewership on it and feel good about it. So kind of answer the question? Cool. Yeah. yeah. So I still fly. I try to minimize my flying. I've flown twice or in the last 12 months or so, or maybe three times. And so for f what I'm doing now is that whenever I'm doing, so for me personally, the more that I, I find the more that I give to others, the more that I live in the service of others, often the more my basic needs are met, which has been one of the really positive things in life is seeing that when you put yourself out there and you help others, that they're more likely to help you as well. So as far as flying, my current trips, like for example, this, this Europe tour that I'm doing, uh, so I'm doing a TEDx talk in Paris, and so they covered my flight to get here. So that's how, so currently I only fly when I'm invited somewhere to come do a, a campaign or, or speaking or something like that. Dumpster diving, uh, so the question, is it legal to dumpster dive in the States? So it's not illegal, but it's not something people want. I mean, most people don't want you in their dumpsters. Uh, so in very few places, it's actually illegal, but they can give you a trespassing ticket or something like that. Um, and how it basically works is the dumpster is technically on their property. So, But the ticket's like $200. So the way I look at it is, Let's, I mean, you can get $1,000 worth of food going dumpster diving in one night. So in a year, you can collect $10,000 worth of food. And if you get a ticket for $200, well, that ticket pretty well paid for itself. Um, so you can get in trouble for dumpster diving, but it's extremely rare. Rare enough where two years ago I put out a, a, a blog saying that if anybody gets arrested for dumpster diving in the United States, I'll get them out of jail, I'll pay all of their fees, and I'll bring media t attention. And it's only happened once in the last two years, and I did that, and the police ran away with their tail between their legs, and they didn't get any any fines, or they got off, you know, without any problem, and now they're back to dumpster diving in their town, so so if you get caught for dumpster diving and you get arrested in Belgium, that, that applies to everyone in this room. Just let me know. We'll take care of you. <laughs> it's the uh, Dumpster Diving Defense Fund is what it's called. Dumpster Divers Defense Fund, yep. Mm, lock in the dumpsters. I don't recommend breaking dumpsters open. But if you are crafty, you might be able to squeeze in. That, uh, that I endorse, squeezing in. You might need to just get a really small person for that. Yeah. Another thing is that actually a lot of people, when it, you know crafty dumpster divers, they find someone who works at the store and they get the combination lock from them. I know a lot of that. People do that. I've never personally done that because I just ride my bike to the next dumpster. But yeah. And also, just uh, as far as questions go, you know, don't be hesitant to ask any question whatsoever. I live a, like a 99.99% .99 transparent life, so money, you know, any of those sorts of things, I'm happy to to talk about if it's something that would be beneficial in any way to you.
Yeah, well, underwear-wise, mine, mine will be good for the whole year. So I, did you say underwear? Yeah. No, I'll just see. I've been wearing the same underwear for like two years now or something like that. I think they'll last another couple of years. Yeah, so I'm I'm the current camp. The project that I'm doing this year is just buying nothing new. So I can buy secondhand anything. It's just about not having virgin materials being used uh, for me. So I can buy anything used. I can also just not wear underwear, which is in the Id the ideal days. Just, you know, yeah. Other questions? Is that a hand up or is that just a roof fondling? Okay. Yeah. I'm just traveling through. Yeah, I'm here for two days. How do I survive? Well, so as far as how I survive, which, so, so I do, some of the public speaking I do, I get paid for that. That's my, so as I said, my salary cap is $5,000 a year. So I have money by living simply to meet my very basic needs. And because I live very simply, $5,000 goes a really long way. So again, it's all about, it's really about community. You know, we can meet, like, you know, ev all of us have a floor that someone else can sleep on, for example, rather than burning $100 on a, on a hotel. So even when places want to pay to put me up in a hotel room, I'm just like, why would I do that? Instead, donate the money to a nonprofit, and I'll just sleep on someone's couch. Other questions? None? Yeah, I've only got about three years left. I'm just planning on, <laughs> you know. Um, my, my, where's my life going? So my goal is to continue doing this, you know, basically till I die, but in one, it not necessarily in the exact same fashion. So uh, one of my next big projects that I'm really excited about is for one year I'm going to grow, forage, or hunt every single thing that I eat down to the, the, to the salt, to the herbs. Um, so that's going to be a really great project for really learning to, you know, I, th I believe that the earth has the resources we need to exist in a way that isn't based around a monetary system and where we can be much healthier and happier, and that's a project that I'm really looking forward to. And then down the line within the next, so so a couple ways, a couple things. This summer, uh, I'm doing a bike ride across the country from uh, New York City to Washington, and we're planting uh, gardens across the country. It's called Good Deeds on Bikes, and anyone is uh, totally welcome to join. So far there's about 40 or so riders that will be starting in New York and going all the way to Seattle. And the nice thing is it's 82 days, so it fits exactly into your 90-day visa. So if you feel like biking across the country this summer, it's going to be an awesome uh, crew of people. We're going to be visiting farms and permaculture centers and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and then ultimately, so that's uh, robgreenfield.tv slash green riders tour if you do want to come. And you can come for all of it or even just parts of it. And then ultimately, my long-term plan is to set up a simple living institute of sorts where people can come learn all of these things in person. And so in 2018, I'll be doing that small scale with my, my urban garden project. So if you're in Orlando in 2018, you can come have some, have some veggies with me. Yeah? Well, my, my earlier dream was to have a lot of money, have a nice house, have a nice car, get married, have kids. Like, I grew up really low income. Uh, my mom made $15,000 a year, and there was four of us kids, so it was a pretty minimal amount. So as a young person, I my dream was to be normal, you know, like that, that tor sort of like American dream, just to live that sort of normal lifestyle. And so that was my dream for at least a decade or more. Um, but as I started to wake up, to the world and that there's so much more. My dream is ex exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, my dream was to live a, f a free life where I can be a positive impact on the world. Well, so, well, two things with that. So, mm. well, my girlfriend's coming on the next bike ride. Yeah. She doesn't dumpster dive, but she stands next to the dumpster, and I pass the food to her. We make a really good team. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, my girlfriend has become, started to live a more, so two years ago, my girlfriend was living in an apartment, 
she still had a lot of bills. And so as we've been together for two years and a quarter, she's been starting to wrap her head around. Like, for example, but when I got rid of my cell phone, she realized, oh, I could maybe get rid of my cell phone, but it still took her about two years before she ever decided to do that. So she got rid of her car. So yeah, my girlfriend lives a similar life. And then one of the really, were you about done? Oh, okay, cool. Um, one of the really nice things that I've seen is that a lot of people have a very gloomy outlook on the world, uh, and there's plenty of good reason to, but one of the nice things that I've seen is that everywhere I've gone, and I've been to 49 states, just not, uh, not Alaska, and about 40-something countries, and everywhere I go, it's just so many people who have woken up to what's going on on Earth and who are making positive changes. Millions of people are becoming more conscious about these things, and everywhere I go, there's more community bike programs, there's more community gardens, there's more people that are just taking the time to feed people who don't have enough food. And everywhere I go, there's more and more of this happening. So that's actually one of the things you, you know, said is there are a lot of people like me, and everybody has their own different way of doing things, but, but yeah, there are. Uh, real success to me is living a life that's always, that not always, but living a life full of happiness, health, and freedom, uh, and and uh, living in a way that's beneficial to the earth, my community, and myself. So dying knowing that I uh, made a positive impact on the world in whatever way that would be, and that ideally when I die, uh, a mountain lion eats me and nobody has to deal with my body. <laughs> and I have no stuff. And I have that would be success, is that when I die, I'm gone, and I have, you know, I've left a positive path, and I don't have a mess for people to clean up when I'm gone. That's, that, you know, that's partial success. Uh, and then success for me is clean water, fresh air, you know, healthy food, the more of that that can be created. Uh, and I guess maybe taking down some major corporations would be huge success as well. So, <laughs> yeah. What was it? EcoU.org. What is it? Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, you're welcome to put me on it. Oh, sure. Yeah. Of course, you, uh, everything that I do is Creative Commons, where you know every uh, you know I don't own anything that I do. It's uh, yeah. Absolutely. The question was, how would I do everything I do with kids? I wouldn't. I would have, I would live. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so much. So the good news about all of this, and I didn't mention this, is but all of these things are things that can be done whether we're 80 years old or 10 years old, whether we have kids or we don't have kids. It's just a matter of applying it to our situation. So one of the good ways of I always try to look at life is that you always have to look at the scenario and then apply it best to your life. So um, all of these things are, are ways that, you, you know, a, a human being does not by nature create piles of trash. That's only because that's the system that we are choosing to be a part of. So, for example, with children, one of the big ones is using reusable diapers rather than disposable diapers, uh, as an example. What's up? Well, the thing is, the, I, the reason that... Comment. Yeah. Translator? Okay. So hmm. here is my best suggestion. Speak to the people who are raising kids. I'm personally not having kids. Bea Johnson has a book called Zero Waste Home. She has two kids and all of her trash fits into a mason jar.
None of this is easy. Yeah, but the system is against every single thing that I talked about tonight. So every the system is generally stacked against doing any of this stuff because the system is is designed to keep us buying and consuming and buying and consuming. So it's easy to look at any of these things and say it's impossible, but it really it does come down to dedication. It does come down to putting a lot of time into these things. You know, so so m maybe for example, if you're raising kids, it's it's more, ab it, you know, you might have to just totally reframe your way of thinking, but I would, really, I would really recommend talking to the parents who raise kids and who are living proof that it's totally possible to live a waste-free life while living a very purposeful life. You know, they can, they can do it a lot better so, than I could. I personally chose not to have children because I saw, the, I saw the challenges that that entailed and thought that there was personally better ways that I could spend my time than raising, raising a kid, personally. Any other questions? Yeah? I I don't have like any particular any particular title. Basically I just eat in a way where I try to cause as little harm to the earth, harm to my body, harm to my community. So it depends on the scenario. And that's one of the things is that uh, to me, existing on earth is about adapting. So for example, you know, for me personally, and sometimes vegans, I think, really, really dislike me because I'm not, because, you, you know, going plant-based is one of the biggest positive changes you can make. But for example, like when I was in Florida, I was camping for 10 days. I caught fish and I ate fish. That was, to me, much more environmentally friendly than going to the grocery store and buying beans that were raised, you know, maybe, fifty, maybe across the other side of the country. So for me, I eat minimal meat, and I eat, oh for the, another thing, like I was ri driving down the road in uh, Totnes, UK last week, and I saw a pheasant on the side of the road, and I was like, I like to move animals off the side of the road so they can, you know, they can integrate into the soil and, and rest in peace. And I picked it up, and it was still warm. It had just died within the last probably half hour or so, uh, and it wasn't bloody at all, so I took it home, and I cooked it, you know. I think that day I had a number of, of really mad vegans at me that day, but the way I looked at it is that was a that was a great usage of resources and and uh, rather than letting it die on the side of the road, so that's my way of doing things as far as food goes. Did I see a question over here? Yeah. Hmm. How angry do I get? Is the question actually minimally angry? Uh, typically, I find that like. As far as staying positive, it's a couple of things. One, well, how many people in the room like want to make the world a better place? Most everyone. So strategically, I've realized that being angry is not going to do it. Being pissed off and yelling at people is rarely going to make them want to change. Because what happens is when you are angry with someone, they get defensive. And once someone is defensive, they put that wall up. There's, no, there's a wall between you, and you're not going to be able to f affect that positive change. Because I'm a logical and rational thinker, I know that I have to be positive to create positive change because you create what you are. So there's that aspect, just remembering staying positive is what's more likely to make people make positive changes. Like Cheryl's mom, for example, is uh, my girlfriend, Cheryl's mom, super unconscious about any of this stuff, has no desire to do it whatsoever. And after three years of Cheryl just being, not like hounding her with it, but by Cheryl being happier and healthier over the last five years, now her mom is saying, man, Cheryl's so happy and healthy. What, she's do what is she doing? And now she's starting to do those things more. So, uh, you know, that's a big part of it. And then another thing is that, you know, I personally believe that life is precious, like all lives, whether it's, whether it's uh, anyone in this room, whether it's a duck that's flying over, even ev you know, even an ant. I believe that all life is precious. I believe that water and air, all of these things are precious. And so, the way I look at life is if each if each day I can just have one positive impact, whether it's making one person uh, happier and healthier, or maybe it's just cleaning up a duck pond so there's less trash in it. By knowing that I made a life better, that way I can stay positive. So just by focusing on the smalls, there's the saying. Uh, think globally, act locally. So by focusing on the positive impact you can make in your community to the people and to the animals around you, 
that's also how I stay positive. So you want to think at the big level, but make sure that you're focusing on, on yourself. And the other thing is focusing on yourself. So all of this stuff, the aim is to not be selfish, but it's not to be selfless. So by doing things that make yourself happier and healthier, uh, it makes the world happier and healthier typically as well. So a lot of these things are extremely rewarding, volunteering at nonprofits, uh, doing random acts of kindness, growing food, all of these things that are better for the earth are also extremely rewarding. So by focusing on living a rewarding life that you actually enjoy, also you're less likely to be pissed off. So, yeah? Yeah, do, uh, so the question is, do I aspire to inspire companies to change? I do, I th you know, I think, so I, I work on a bottom up, you know, approach rather than the top down approach because the top down approach will never be successful without the bottom up as well, I believe, because you need the people to rise up to make positive changes. But at the same time, when a corporation, when a corporation makes a positive change, that's something that can be so massive, more massive than all of us combined making positive changes today. So, but my way of doing that is, is realizing that everybody who works at a corporation is a human being. So simply by reaching human beings, you can get them to hopefully light little fires inside of them and have them make positive changes. But I also do speak at corporations. I spoke at Deloitte, uh, which is like a uh, insurance firm in, what? Consultant firm. I think, in, are they the devil or are they all right? Anyone know? Devil? Okay, so I spoke there yesterday, and then uh, I spoke at TUI Group the day before that, which is like one of the larger travel agencies around. So definitely speak at corporations. Other questions? Last one, did you say? Cool. Yeah. That's not off topic at all because the fact that we're so stuck to our screens is to me one of the largest contributing factors to the destruction of society and, and the earth. So um, I struggle with that as well. I spend a lot of time on screens, hence the glossy eyes a little bit today because I was up last night working on the screen till about 2, 2.30 in the morning. So for me, I think that one of the most important things we can do is spend less time on screens. And so that doesn't mean that you can't be on it at all, but it means m moderation. So what I d when I'm at my happiest, what I do is I have a, s about I have a, s a set of sort of guidelines. One is that uh, I turn off all electronics at least one hour before bed, um, and then I wait at least a half hour after waking up before turning on uh, any electronics. So no rolling out of bed and looking right at the email. So waiting a half hour, instead going outside, taking a breath of fresh air, stretching for five minutes, maybe drink, drinking a glass of water, um, and then limiting it to eight hours per day, five days a week. So 40, 40 hours per week on the screen, which is still a lot, but by limiting it to eight hours a day, you actually have 16 hours possibly where you're actually off of it. And then another big one, you know, a life-changing thing for me is you know, I, d I haven't had a cell phone for about two years, and I didn't think, almost thought it was impossible to live without a cell phone. Um, but what happened, what I did is when I decided to get rid of my cell phone, I put it first into a drawer at my house and said I wouldn't use it for just one month. And that way I was able to, like, not jump fully off the deep end and see how it was. And it totally changed my life. But before that, the thing I did was just for 24 hours. I turned my phone off and left it at home and actually left my house without a cell phone, which was the first time I had done that basically since having a cell phone besides like camping, but actually being out in San Diego without one. So yeah, that, those are some of my, uh, my tips. There's awesome uh, appli applications you can use. Like there's websites that once you, use, once you use the internet for a certain amount of time, all those sites will be blocked until the next day. Uh, there's also Trump blocker that blocks him completely from your internet, which is really a way to stay not pissed off. Um, <laughs> and then you can block your Facebook news feed. Like I recently unfollowed everyone in my news feed, and when I decide I want to follow people, I'm going to 
individually choose what. So a big thing is being conscious of what the information you consume. So, okay, maybe you want to be on top of politics, but doesn't mean you need to have it infiltrating your head every 15 minutes. So consciously choosing to consume information rather than just consuming whatever happens to cross your screen at that moment. So that's some of my thoughts on that. How do you want other readers to do the same? Probably talk about it. Like a lot of people have never even thought of the idea of leaving their phone at home for 24 hours. So talk to your friend and say, hey, let's go out for 24 hours. Let's go out for six hours today without our phones. Let's go on an adventure without our phones. So starting with small steps would be, you know, I would say leading by example and, um, and coming up with fun ways to get your friends involved in doing that sort of thing. So uh, we've got zero more questions, right? Zero more questions? Yeah. So, but I. But what time is it? Sing? No, sing. I'll never sing. Um, yeah. My name's really Greenfield. Yeah. I. Uh, I guess. We'll, and we'll take a question. What is it? Hmm. I. Yeah. The question was: Do I feel like I'm creating a religion? No, because all of this is, uh, don't, don't listen to just, one of my things is don't just listen to anybody who tells you something. Go online, do the research, and make sure that you're making positive, making changes for the reason. So do I feel like I'm uh, making religion? No, I just feel like I'm speaking some common sense to the world. And, uh, you know, ideally just, what? Hmm. You're, you, all right, you figured me out. <laughs> who wants to join my cult? What's the initiation for the cult? All right. We're, never mind. Cancel that. Yeah. Yes. Big up. Big up. Um, people say, by the way, that I look like Jesus Christ. No? Okay. Um, I think it's time for a little break. You know, drink something. Get out there, you know, get some fresh air, get some fire. But then stick around because we still have some funky, fresh stu stuff coming up. Okay? So, yeah, I can, I can. I try to. Okay, so stay around, stay cool, stay chill. Kapow, you know, Kapow is now. Rob Greenfield is now. We are all now. The future is now. <laughs>